Welcome to a new series we are calling Conversations With. My name is Shaylee Hugendorn and I live with Bipolar 2 Disorder. And my name is Julie Kraft and I am also living with Bipolar 2 Disorder. Julie and I believe in the power of storytelling. We know that sharing with others is healing both individually and collectively. There are so many different experiences. So we wanted to share more stories of Bipolar with you and interview others. Our stories are powerful. They can become a source of strength and hope and inspiration. Our voices need to be heard. Our stories aren't over yet. This is Bipolar. Hi friends, welcome back to This Is Bipolar Conversations with Series. I am really excited to be here today because I have two special ladies that we just really connect online and it's such a beautiful, beautiful thing. If you haven't listened before, I'm Shaylee Hugendorn. I am a mama, I am a wife, a teacher, an event planner, and a fierce mental health advocate. Um, and my pronouns are she, her. So I have Paris and I have Sarah. And the cool thing is I get to hang out with two other podcasters. So um, we, uh, uh, Julie and I have actually been on Sarah's podcast it's called Rough Edges. And then Paris has Master Your Mental. And I'm actually going to tell them, ask them to explain a little bit more about themselves. And so Paris, tell us a little bit about you. Yes. Awesome. So I'm super excited to be here with both you guys. I love seeing all your stuff online. I've had the pleasure of interviewing Sarah actually on my podcast, Master Your Mental. And so a little bit about me is I am the host of Master Your Mental, which is a podcast that I started about two years ago. It was originally called the Crooked Illness Podcast, which is now the name of my book and memoir that Shaylee has and has read and then kind of talked about. And then we kind of talked about too with Sarah as well, kind of a little bit about the book, but yeah. So podcast podcaster, author, and I really kind of use my story as a way to empower and uplift others to help them shatter that stigma that is kind of holding them back from moving forward or wanting to share. So that's really what it's all about is how to start crafting that life that you're passionate about and getting out, getting out of that, that the stigma piece of it. So that's a little bit, a little bit about me of the podcast, the book, all that stuff. And you guys can follow, follow me, tune in. I always love hearing from you at master mm -hmm. mental on Instagram. And then we also have um, yeah. And then I'm big, big into gratitude. I have a gratitude community as well on uh, Facebook. When you just type in free gratitude journal, you get, get access to it. It's a free nice. -day journal. So there's a little gift there, but yep. 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 Just happy, super happy to be here and can't wait to dive in. Awesome. Awesome. And how about you tell us about Sarah? Yes, so I am also equally so excited to be here, and it's amazing to just be in a space where we can shatter the stigma together. I am the host of the Rough Edges podcast, which is a podcast all about my mental health journey, but it also encompasses faith mm -hmm. and how mental health and faith intersect and how we can use both to properly heal. Mm -hmm. And so I am working in the real estate industry. I am an assistant community manager at Rose Community Management, and I am also a writer. I have my own blog at sarahifox.com, where I write all about justice, relationships, womanhood, um, African-American um, community awesome. topics, and everything else like that. And so I'm also a comic book nerd. So I, I, I really it's a Marvel and the only one I love from DC is Batman. So he's like the best for me. <laughs> <laughs> and so yeah, that's a little bit about me. And didn't you review? I feel like I saw a post where you reviewed something to do with Batman. Yeah. Yes, I did. I love it. I love it. That's <laughs> so awesome. That's so awesome. Well, friends, let's just dive into your stories here at This Is Bipolar. We just believe in the power of storytelling and seeing ourselves um, in other people's stories and being moved and inspired by them and also just feeling understood. And before we get started, as always, we talk about hard things. 
on this is bipolar we talk about messy things um, and there might be things that might activate you or trigger you um, we talk about things like um, mental hospitals we talk about sometimes we talk about sexual violence and other things that have happened in our lives so I just hope that you could take care of yourself take breaks and come back when you feel safe so with that being said, I would love to hear, um, Paris, when did you know that something was wrong or that there's something you felt like that there was something just going on inside your head? When did, when did you know, or when did that start for you? Yeah. Um, I love that question. And for me, it started probably around like 14 ish years old. I just, I noticed it was strict for me, kind of noticing just more feelings of a lot of depression and sadness and a lot of it kind of with like moving and different things like that that a lot of people experience and go through but something I noticed is that it just didn't seem to go away you know it was like I was like oh maybe this will last and then but it just it stayed and a lot of that is from a young age too of not you know feeling like I can talk about it or like share it because mm -hmm. now today like with conversations like these we're so open and transparent and and talking mm -hmm. about these things but yeah so basically from early on and then also, you know, from a young age too, that I talk about in the book of going through, you know, sexual abuse and things like that. And then not knowing like how to communicate it. And then when you do, it's kind of, you know, like almost blamed or like shut down. So it really makes you feel like never talk about it again, never share it. And that really is a lot to kind of carry that within yourself. So yeah, from that's kind of when I noticed like different things of just trying to distract myself and just basically mm -hmm. almost kind of like living in a facade a little bit of, you know, wanting to kind of not have people think like, okay, what do I have to do to help her to not want that almost like a no. burden kind of in a sense is kind of what I experienced. But yeah, so basically from a young age from that, and then kind of just almost feeling like this is just the way it is, you know, and kind yeah. of having this belief. And, you know, that was before I kind of got into work of doing re more research on this, you know, looking online, having more conversations with other people, getting into more mental health. I was not like that. So that's definitely helped. But yeah, I felt really stuck for probably years, like 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, like, like seven, eight, nine ish years in that um, kind of back and forth between like the sadness and then like being so much energy working, you know, two jobs in school, you know, doing all the things and just kind of yeah. not being able to slow down. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you guys can definitely hundred percent relate, but yeah, that's just kind of a little bit, a little snippets into what it was like, and just feeling like you're always tense. Yeah. You're just always tense. Like it's never, you can't just be in the middle. It's always, you're too much on the sadder side or too much on the higher end where you almost yeah. get, you know, overly, you know, upset or you think too much when people, you think that people you're very, like, I experienced a lot of that, you know, thinking that people mm -hmm. weren't supportive or weren't there and just overthinking and then kind of jumping to conclusions and writing these stories in my mind. So that was a lot of that from just a young, young age. And that's kind of what I noticed, but wow. yeah, I can't wait to hear. Um, more yeah. Time. Yeah. Before I asked Sarah, I just wanted to, I just wanted to tell little Paris when I was reading this book, I just wanted to hug you. I'm, I'm so sorry that happened to you. And I'm so sorry you had to keep it inside. I was just like, Oh, I want to hug little Paris. So just know that I honor you for sharing your story because that is brave and hard. Thank you. Thank you. I love you. And I appreciate it really. Mm -hmm. So Sarah, when did you know, when did you feel like there was something, something wrong or did you feel different? Tell us about that. Yeah. So Paris, I really think that we lived vicariously through each other because um, my experience is pretty similar. Uh, I knew that something was wrong in high school at age 16 mm -hmm. and I was feeling very depressed, very low. Um, there was a lot of family drama going on behind the scenes and then there was a lot of high school drama you know loss of friendships and different things that kind of encompassed that entire journey and so I was feeling very low very depressed and I also knew that something was wrong when I was emotionally eating and uh -huh. so I would just eat a lot of sugar a lot of junk food and just mm -hmm. binge on fast food and until the point where I got to an unhealthy weight mm -hmm. and 
it was just very debilitating because I noticed like my breathing was changing. Mm -hmm. I noticed that the way I carried myself, I felt very sluggish and fatigued. Mm -hmm. And so that was most of my high school experience, just feeling very depressed and very Mm -hmm. just bottling up so many emotions that I didn't know where to begin. And so in college, I decided to go to therapy. Mm -hmm. And I must say that in the African-American community, uh, therapy is stigmatized, heavily stigmatized, especially in the church. And so we believe that God can heal anything. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we look down on therapy because we think we don't need Jesus plus something else to help us Mm -hmm. get through. And Mm -hmm. so that is an unhealthy thinking pattern that I wanted to go away from. Mm -hmm. And so when I started therapy in college, it was really scary for me because I was just unpacking a lot of these emotions and I was just going through so many things all at once. And I was just telling a complete stranger all of my quote unquote family business. Right. So I was just very very relieved but at the same time I knew that things were going wrong and not receiving that support initially was something that really dawned on me it's like I know that something is wrong I feel it within myself I feel it within my body but nobody's really taking it as seriously as I would want them to and the over spiritualization of my issues also contributed to me feeling a little depressed because a lot of people would say, oh, just pray about it or speak this verse over that issue. And I would just be praying about it, speaking the verses and nothing would change. And so that contributed to my depression because I thought no matter what I do, nothing's working. Mm -hmm. So that's really the starting point of where I knew something was really wrong. Yeah, two parts really stuck out to me when you were talking, Um, just talking about uh, your community and just how that's different. I've been doing um, some reading and a lot of, um, you know, my Black friends have been saying there's the one thing too is that there's also not a lot of Black therapists. So you're going to someone that doesn't truly understand understand your experience so I'm just very curious if you're willing to share did you find a black therapist or was it a white therapist and how how do you feel about that so my first ever therapist in college was a white therapist yeah so that was already a little bit awkward so Mm -hmm. I decided to keep the racial elements out of it and just stick with the family elements But that didn't really help because my campus was a predominantly white campus. And so whenever I felt things that were racially charged or I felt like this is a cultural aspect that I'm not really comfortable processing, Mm -hmm. I didn't know how to go to my therapist about those things. I didn't know how to talk about it because I felt like she didn't understand me. But fast forward right now, I do have a black therapist and it's going very well. And I get to process a lot of like racial anxiety, racial trauma in white spaces and really Mm -hmm. getting to come to a point where I can share my story in those spaces and not feel like my journey is minimized or affected by my race. So yeah, I... I had the experience of having both of them. Oh, wow. Wow. Thanks for sharing that. Look at you, like being the first to go to therapy and then also smashing stigma in the church, like silent high fives for that friend. That's amazing. (laughs) Awesome. Well, Paris, I'd love to come back to you and talk about um, leading up right before the diagnosis and what did that look like? And was it something that you... um, you pursued or did it happen to you? I already know because of your book, but I would love for you to tell our listeners. Yeah, no, of course. And I actually was diagnosed twice. So at 16 years old, diagnosed with depression, which at first I thought it was a misdiagnosis. And I always thought that, but when I think back to it, all I experienced up until that point was depression. 
Right. So that's what happened at 16 diagnosed with depression. Then when I was 19 years old, that's when I was hospitalized and I was hospitalized. That's when I got the diagnosis of bipolar one disorder. Mm -hmm. And I was hospitalized for two weeks. It was placed on court ordered treatment. That's when I first started taking lithium because I've been on all kinds of different medications from Mm -hmm. my previous diagnosis that I noticed were almost putting me into have it being manic because it's like a thing when mm-hmm. you're having depression, you know, the misdiagnosis of when you're, yeah. So I went through that, but what I, what the diagnosis is really, you know, showed me is that, you know, this is, I used to think it was a bad thing just because of something that I didn't really touch on in the beginning was having this in my family. So a history yes. in my family, right. So I actually talk about it, a relative of mine, in the book who has bipolar and then kind of wanting to talk about it with more of my family. And it's like, no, you know, and then, or then having it be like, oh, she's, we can't deal with her. She's just too much. She's always doing these. It's a lot. It's exhausting. I can't handle her. And when I would see this person, I didn't see that. So it was very hard, you know, especially when it happens to you, when you're the one you're like, oh, like now I got this how am I going to be looked at or perceived or treated? And it wasn't good. So uh, a lot of it was very hard, but what I decided to do is just kind of try to learn as much as I could, you know, I'm like, okay, if this is what it is, then there has to be things that I can do. There has to be some kind of solutions because for so long, I focused on what wasn't working, what was going wrong, the problems, the issues, you know, the fear of a lot of like, Oh, I'm going to have to, am I going to have to be on this medication for the rest of my life forever? When is it going to end this back? Cause I've only one time really gone off the medication for a period of three months. And then actually went, decided to go back on. Cause I noticed different things within myself, but, um, but yeah, that's a big, really, really important question. And, you know, I can't wait to kind of hear what Sarah says too, and what she kind of noticed. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then I want to hear more about your experience because we have listeners from all over the world, and I live in Canada, so oh. I'm very curious about. I, I I didn't hear the word court sanctioned. Is that what it's called? Court, court ordered treatment. Yeah, tell me about tell me about that and kind of what was actually happening in your life that led led up to that. I want to hear uh, the juicy details are in okay. here and the hard stories in the book. Yes. Yeah. So what led up to I actually, I was seeing a psychiatrist at the time and for a period I wasn't because they were like, well, you're, you're doing, you're getting straight A's in school, you know, you're working, you don't seem like, and I, and I would constantly in my mind and like racing race, I'm like, and I'm trying to say this and it's like, because you don't look like it on the outside, it's almost like, you know, what are we going to do for you or why are you here really? So what led up to that is just, you know, me just having a lot of complications too. I I was in a relationship and just ended that actually ended that relationship. And then it was really hard. And I remember just thinking like, you know, what if I take, you know, a couple of these, my medication and see, maybe it'll make me feel different. And it just basically kicked me into a manic being where I was like texting him and just, you know, saying all these terrible things. And, you know, of course, you know, he's like, well, now I'm, I don't want to continue this. And then I was like, oh no. And then it was like, you know, all this whole thing. And then just back and forth and with just putting myself in unsafe situations, honestly. So after that, you know, just going, drinking a lot, going out a lot, trying to just be, be around people who honestly, I feel like, you know, really enjoyed being around me because I was pretty yeah, entertaining. Totally. And I would just yeah. say, I would say and do things that you almost see in movies and that's not real life. And now it's like, it's kind of hard to even think back to that. Cause I'm like how, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot, but yeah, that's really what happened. And what happened with the, the hospitalization is I was actually at my appoint, appointment with my psychiatrist. And he, I was like, I think I have this, I think this is what's going on. And I just, it was like, no. And I just remember just like storming out and leaving. And then they actually called the police that earlier that day and came wow. and then nothing happened, but I left. And then I remember I, after that, I was, at, you know, ended up going to this outdoor like shopping mall at some point and just calling constantly call, over and over again, like the police. And I just, it's like, I just feel like it was out of my body almost like yeah. crying and just, I could not like yeah. come back and focus. And it was like, so focused on like, what's wrong. And this is never going to, and it just, it was so a lot going on at that time and not being able to come down from this, but I feel like the hospitalization 
I was, I called the police again on my, on myself. And they finally came to where I was at my parents' house and took me into this place that's called UPC, which is an urgent psychiatric center where they basically evaluate you and then say, okay, we're going to transfer her to, if they have an open bed somewhere to this hospital or you leave. And then I went into the, the hospital and, you know, a lot of the stuff that I saw, I was pretty shocked by, but we can probably get into that. Yeah. Yeah. After, um, um, Sarah shares, but yeah, I'll definitely go into that deeper for sure. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just that it's so interesting. It's, it's like, you knew it's like, you couldn't stop, but you knew. And I think that's one thing that people, um, don't understand about bipolar and how you talked about out of body. Mm-hmm. And I, I have experienced that I have bipolar too. So I, I get hypomania. So I always try to imagine because it was so intense. Mm-hmm. I can't imagine it to be even, even more intense. So I'm really drawn to both your stories. Mm-hmm. So Sarah, how about you? Tell me leading up to your diagnosis. And, um, you know, we've spoken before that you, that you were hospitalized as well. Lead us into that. Tell us what was going on. Yeah. So I was in college at the time and I was actually on the cusp of graduating. Mm -hmm. So I graduated and then I was on cloud nine. That's Mm -hmm. when it started. Um, It usually starts when you're feeling like this elevated sense of superiority and also excitement. And so I was already excited about graduating. And then I got a job and it was in the real estate industry, but I was like, okay, I have a job, you know, it's during the pandemic and things are hard. So I'm grateful to God that I have a job. And so that added to my excitement. And then more people were visiting my blog because I was uh, guest writing on another website uh, that empowers women as well. And so through the articles that I wrote for them, people, I was getting more traffic. And so that added to my excitement. Mm-hmm. And so I was to the point where all of these events were building up to the point where I was getting very excited, very hyper, very energized. And one thing that really tipped me off to the point where this is not a good kind of happiness or a normal kind of yeah. happiness was when I started speaking so fast that I was incoherent the entire time. Wow. Nobody understood what I was saying. I didn't understand what I was saying. I was just talking. And as the thoughts were coming, I would just keep talking. And it was just a back and forth type of mania that I was experiencing and so one morning around like the new year's time I had to go into work because I had to do a tour for this couple that wanted to see the apartment and on my way to work I was having an anxiety attack and it came out of nowhere I my I was having heart palpitations I was breathing super heavily very fast and I felt like I was going to pass out And I called my mom and I was like, mom, I don't know what's happening. Like these things are going on with me. Like, I don't know if I'm going to make it to work. And she was just like, you need to slow down and calm down. And she said, if you can't calm down, just turn around and come home. And so I was like, okay, I can do this. I, I can go to work. I can, I can kill it at work. I can, I can do this. And so I'm guessing like the mania took over at that point because I was able to calm myself down with like worship music and being in a good mood. So the happy mood kind of subsided the anxiety attack. Mm -hmm. And so I went to work and I came back home and that was the end of that or so I thought. Mm -hmm. And so I was in a state of mania and I also started feeling these rapid mood swings. It was like I would go into a cycle of feeling happy, but then I would feel depressed immediately afterwards. Mm. And I was, during the depressed moments, I was crying a lot. Mm. I couldn't get out of bed. I felt, there was one moment where I felt paralyzed from the neck down in my bed and I couldn't feel anything. I couldn't get up. I was just very depressed. And then 
afterwards, the depression would subside, and then I would go back into mania, speaking fast, being happy. And so my family was just like, what is happening to you? Wow. Like, what is going on? And then I moved into a state of being manic, from being manic into going into like an aggressive period where I was having an outer body experience. I was experiencing some psychosis. I was seeing things, I was hearing things and they were like demonic images. Oh. And I was just very scared. I was fighting people off. I was, you know, punching, kicking, screaming, just being very aggressive to the point where my mom, she called the police. And they came to the house and they had to strap me down to a gurney and take me to the hospital. So that's the events that led up to me being hospitalized. Wow. Wow. Whew, that's hard. I, you brought up something um, really important and I'm actually curious, uh, Paris, to talk to you about this too. I think it's something that's like kind of the ugly side of bipolar that's really hard to talk about, but I don't know. Um, I wrote an article, I was interviewed for an article for BP Hope magazine and they talked about, they were like, oh, it's gonna be about anger. And I was like, okay, I can use the word anger. And then it came out and they had called it bipolar rage. And actually I joke about it because the image they picked was like this giant angry rhinoceros. And I was like, oh my gosh, my name's attached to this. But, <laughs> Just to tell you that funny story, but um, because I don't like, especially like as women, we're not expected to be angry and there's all this. And then uh, uh, I'm a woman of faith as well, Sarah, and in the church, like to be angry. But I don't know about you all, but I can go like when I'm feeling like that, it's so hard not to be angry. And I know later I'm not going to be angry about it, but I think what people don't understand is that it it almost like takes over your body like I can tell myself you're not actually that angry right now but my body's reacting like I'm furious like my husband says you look so angry I'm like well I'm not actually that mad but my body's very angry right and I think what's hard too even about uh, mental illness uh, in general is that everybody feels a little slice of the things we've felt right whereas a physical illness I've never felt what it's like to have diabetes or heart disease so then I believe everything that someone says that has that and I think that um, what's really, really hard is that people say, oh, I've experienced that too. Or do you know what I mean? I've been sad too, or I've been angry like you, Sarah, and really they don't understand the depths of it. So I so appreciate um, you both talking about um, just the how it takes over. It doesn't seem um, like it, it's not, it doesn't seem like it's in your control, right? Mm -hmm. I saw this post, I think it was, I don't know, yesterday, and it said ideas or feelings like ideas in mania don't feel like ideas, they feel like demands, like it feels like your body demands you to, you know, keep moving forward, kind of like you were talking, Sarah, about that, the speaking, it's almost like a motor, right? I always like to describe those things, because I know we have listeners that are neurotypical, or maybe just love someone with bipolar, or most likely there's someone in your life that has a mood disorder, but hasn't told anyone. So I really appreciate you both sharing um, your experiences with symptoms. Um, I would love to hear, and I know Paris, you touched on it a little bit, but I would love to hear about the months after your diagnosis. I know um, Paris, you had already talked about, there was this image in your family, and we know actually, we know mood disorders run in families, that it was, like terrible and maybe I'm not sure I can't remember in the story maybe the person in your family was undiagnosed I'm not sure if they were on medication or anything like that but I know you had your family was like oh that's the the bipolar one and so you had a hard time but could you tell us a little bit more about how you dealt with your um, diagnosis right away yeah so it's actually when I came out of the hospital that's actually when I, I was 19 so I was in the hospital actually from December 22nd I think of 2014 until January 5th. So through the holidays, all of that. Oh, wow. And I came home and I was actually in, still in community college at this point before I transferred to 
university. And I remember like when I came home, I just told everybody, I remember I went to my class and I'm like, wow. I had this one class and I'm like, oh yeah, I was just hospital. And then I, then I started to like, then I had a period of where I was like, I'm never going to talk about this again because being so, old. and I feel like, I don't know. It was like, I think it was the, the thoughts came back of like me overthinking of like, oh, you're being judged or it's too much or no one, you're just putting this on everyone and no one's asking for the details around it. And I love how you kind of say like the demands thing. Cause it felt that's kind of the months after I came home, that's really how I felt. I remember there was this one time where I got in my car for the first time and I hit the accelerate and it just like shot and everything felt like it was so like, I remember like I even had a dress and there was like a piece of fabric that was like, or like a dust or something was coming off of it. And I just was like, like, I, could, I don't know, like just everything was so much more intense. And I feel like it's because, you know, may, maybe a combination of like when I was hospitalized, I was only sleeping like four hours a night just because of what I went experience with like the, diff, the, my roommates and like a lot of people, like it was very hard to, for me, feel safe in there after the things that I've seen and different, like a lot of violence happening and like different things like that and not feeling like I can protect myself or other people. So for me coming home from that, like the transition out of it was a lot. I remember the first night I couldn't sleep at all. And like Sarah talked about, I would, I've never had this happen, but I, but when I was in the, came home from the hospital, I would see things like figures and I would hear like set, like I would be listening to music and the words would change, or I would be, I would start to hear things and see things. And I think a lot of that too was the sleep like not like I wanted to I was so tired so exhausted but I could not it's like it was almost like in survival mode and like I have to stay awake I can't you know do this and really like the biggest thing that you know coming out of that was like I love how you also talk about the you know so hard not to be angry because I definitely felt that like it's almost like when you're like don't don't say this and you tell yourself don't say this don't do this and I say I'm not going to do it and then you get in the situation and you just can't And it's like, you lose control and it's like you, and then also saying things that are really hurtful Mm -hmm. too. And knowing like, this is not something you should be doing and you do it. And then it's like, you know, Oh, I'm sorry. Or you really are, but it's like, what is, you know, this, this thing of like, not, and now I know, you know, now when I get in these situations, I kind of just think of what really helps me is thinking that, you know, sometimes when there's people have different reactions to things, sometimes it has nothing to do with you. Oh, totally. And that is because I, I used to take everything so personal, like everything. It's like, it's about me. I did something. They don't like me. Mm-hmm. They're judging me. And, you know, or maybe it's like, you think maybe I, I say something and you think you're going to get this reaction and you don't. And then mm-hmm. you're like upset and like hurt by it. But then it, it, yeah. So many of these different things, like what you guys are talking about, I definitely experience, experience for sure. Like after, you know, coming home and trying to readjust and then having, you know, lo- actually lost a lot of weight because when I was in the hospital, they actually, they, without asking me, um, said that I had a, um, what was it? A eating disorder and put me on these special shakes that they would make me drink. And I like in the past, like I've struggled with that, like a little bit, but it wasn't like, yeah. So, and I remember I, I was so afraid in there that I really couldn't eat or get meals down. So I remember coming home and I thought that I was like, oh, I, you know, probably gained weight or whatever. And I'd lost like 10 or 15 pounds or something. And then I remember it was, it was hard because people would be, you know, say already, you know, oh, you're so small. And it wasn't like an, in a good way kind of thing. And it was just, it's, it's hard. Like when you're coming out of that kind of environment and I almost kind of felt like I would have been safer in prison almost because you're at least you're in your cell with, you know, you're not, you know, I don't know, but it was a lot. So that is kind of little bit of the experiences that I had coming wow. out of that and then trying to readjust to my life back in work. And then, you know, saying, Oh, I wasn't, I was hospitalized. And they're like, people look at you, like, how do you just say that like that? And now, and then I had a period of time where I couldn't say that with different jobs, like, yeah. because I've said it and people use it against you almost. And they yeah. don't sometimes realize it and it's, it's hard. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I can, I can relate to that. I think you brought up um, something really interesting and I'm curious if that's a, a similar experience. Well, I, when I came out of it, it's like, I wanted people to know because it, this was like this life-changing thing, 
but yet I didn't. So it was like this weird when, when I told people, it was just matter of fact, like I need people to know, but then also same, I was like, Oh, wait a minute. Cause you watch faces. Right. And people don't know what to say and people get weird. Right. And um, yeah, I thought that was really interesting. And actually both of you touched on this, but I wanted to talk about it because it was this huge aha for me after I was diagnosed. So in periods of depression, I think I related to you, Sarah, I would like, I would binge, but not purge, but just binge. So I actually got, and like Sarah, I mean, Paris, you said something, they talked about your eating in there. I actually got diagnosed with an eating disorder, but it was only three months out of the year when I was depressed. Right. Mm -hmm. And then I would forget to eat when I was manic. And then I remember that me just not being able to understand that. And I remember my deepest depression, like I gained like 26 pounds in a month. Like it was a lot. I was so hyper-focused on food because I felt like I could control it. And then when I went after I was diagnosed, when I went to um, my therapist, she's like, oh, that's very normal with a mood disorder. And I'm like, ah, it's so frustrating that with, um, you know, like not all doctors know about mood disorders, or I get it, there are general practitioners, they might not all know, but I think it's really, really hard. And many people like Paris, you said you got diagnosed with depression, I got diagnosed with depression, like it's really hard to get um, to actually get a diagnosis. So I encourage our listeners, the thing that doctors um, really cl like cling to and listen is if you describe the mania. We want to talk about the depression more because it almost feels harder or I romanticize the mania, right? I don't remember how bad it actually got, but if we talk about that, that's easier. Anyways, because people always ask me like, how did you get your diagnosis? So that, that made me, um, made me think of that thing. Sarah, how did you deal after you heard the words? Did you hear the words in the hospital? Um, how did you find out about your diagnosis and how did you feel immediately after? So I actually got a packet in the hospital that said bipolar one disorder. And I was, when the nurse handed it to me, I was looking at it like, um, did you give me the wrong packet? Because I think I have depression. But she was just like, no, this is your diagnosis. Read up on it really quickly. Then you're going to meet up with the doctor so she can give you more information on what this diagnosis actually is and everything. And I went back to my room and I sobbed. Like, I was just so distraught at this diagnosis that I didn't know what to do. First of all, I didn't know who to tell because I just didn't understand it. And so when I spoke with the doctor, she was explaining it, but I couldn't hear anything. I wasn't even listening. I was just trying to get over the initial shock of having bipolar disorder because I was always hearing these things like these sayings that people have about oh the weather is so bipolar or stop acting yeah. so bipolar and so I would just be like okay that's insensitive but I didn't really think anything of it until I actually got the diagnosis and so all I could keep thinking is what are people going to think about me after this okay. and I was just numb I was in denial Mm -hmm. I thought I got misdiagnosed. I kept telling everybody, oh, it's a misdiagnosis because most of my family already knew that I was hospitalized, but they didn't know that I had this diagnosis. So right. the diagnosis was kept under wraps because my mom was like, okay, we're going to give them information slowly. We're not going to tell them everything. We're just going to let them know that you were in the hospital and that you're home and you're okay. So nobody worries. And so I was like, fine, yes, keep the diagnosis under wraps because, <laughs> because I don't want anybody to know about this. And then afterwards, I just felt a sense of just deep sadness because I didn't know where to go with this. I didn't know what people were going to think about me. And I just didn't know how to view myself. Because yeah. when you get diagnosed with a mental illness, it's like you're used to operating on a certain level of functionality. But then after you get the diagnosis, it's like, is my past self really gone now? Like, am I an entirely different person? 
So I had to grapple with a lot of like identity searching and just, you know, feeling like I'm an entirely different person because I have this diagnosis. And I just want to encourage like the listeners that your diagnosis is not indicative of your character. It is just something that you have more information about and it tells you why you were experiencing these certain symptoms. So that took me forever to learn. And um, I'm just happy that I did learn to see the difference, but I just want to encourage anybody who's listening that you don't have to label yourself just because you've, you've received a diagnosis doesn't mean that that's the end of your story. And I had to move out of the denial And it's, it was through listening to podcasts like this, this is bipolar and master your mental. I was actually listening to both of your podcasts because I was Googling bipolar disorder. What do I do? Like (laughs) I was just going on a frenzy and then I found your podcast and I was like, okay, these people understand. Mm. I know what to do now. I can accept this diagnosis. So I want to thank you both for just being instrumental in helping me overcome this. But fast forward to me doing a podcast, I finally got to the point where I was like, if these people can share their story, I can share my story as well. And so I... I was kind of scared at first because I was like, oh no, like what is everybody going to think? Nobody wow. knew about my diagnosis up until this point. So I was just like, I'm just going to reveal it. It's going to be okay. And we're going to go from there. And long story short, Rough Edges came to be, and it was through hearing stories like you guys that really motivated me to go out there and be an advocate for those who cannot have a voice for themselves. Oh, we love you. Yes. (laughs) Yes. Zoom group hug. (laughs) I love that. I love that so much. Um, I feel like we have so much more to talk about. So I would actually, that was so inspirational. I would actually love to do a part two. So I would love to hear, I feel like I have a lot more questions. So I would love to do a part two. So I wanted to say thank you for being on here. And I want everyone else, this is going to come out, but then I'm going to put the next one out two weeks later. Okay. So what I want to say right now, thank you so much. And this is Bipolar and keep tuned in because it's going to come and I want you to hear the rest because I feel like um, our friends Paris and Sarah have so much things to tell us about um, you know healing journeys and I want to hear more about their podcasts so tune in. Thank you so much for joining us today on this episode. You can find previous as well as future episodes on YouTube for the video version. You can find the podcast on Apple, Spotify, Google Play, and Podbean. And we spend most of our time where you can join our community and interact on Instagram at this.is.bipolar. It is so helpful if you enjoy our work or think it would be helpful to someone if you could like and share and save and follow us in all or any of those spaces. Another thing that's really, really helpful if you're a listener for the podcast, if you could leave a review, we would be forever grateful. Again, thank you for being here with us. Let's get the word out. Let's share lived experiences so that we can change the ideas that people have about bipolar and help those of us that live with it feel less alone. See you next time.